tonight is Wednesday, September the 3rd. This is Management 4720 Strategy and Policy. And uh, we're going to chat through a few issues and things tonight. I noticed that uh, all but one student turned in the first assignment on time. That was always reassuring. Um, I will be, I didn't want to post any grades or give any feedback until the deadline had passed. Uh, so I'll be getting grades back to you in the next couple of days on that. But they were generally, generally pretty satisfactory. Some folks took off on a little bit different slant. But we'll get to that here in a minute. Let's, uh, let's talk first about the general outline of the course. And I'll be frank with you, this, this course is a constant work in process. Um, I am tasking you with using the textbook so that you can see what traditional approaches are taken to strategy. I'm sure that easily before the end of the first chapter in the textbook, you'll recognize that textbooks on strategy are somewhat removed from reality, very much removed from the reality most of us experience coming out of college at the bachelor's level and at any age less than 55 where you're not running a Fortune 500 company. So their approach for this global corporate management is particularly inept or irrelevant for most of the things you and I would experience in our careers. Uh, given that, I still am going to ask you to go through a few chapters, but I am going to weigh that part of the, tech, the course very lightly. I just want you exposed to it. Um, the rest of the course will be made up of, as I say, my own materials, which are a work in process, still developing. So we may make some changes, but I know every one of you to some degree or another in this course. I have complete respect for every one of you. And I figure we're all going to do this together and enjoy it, and hopefully you'll get something worthwhile out of it. So, where to begin? Hmm. What's, I don't recall that I brought the part with the grades breakdown. Did I give you that, how the grades are determined in here? On the syllabus? Was it on the syllabus? I don't yes. recall. Yeah. Would you read it to me if you have it? Yeah, sure. You've got uh, assignments one through five. Okay, assignments one through five. Uh, five at 20 points each. So those are at 20 each, so there's 100. Mm -hmm. Assignment six. That's the biggie. Is the biggie, is 100 by itself. Uh -huh. Team evaluation is 10. Uh, I think that's part of that. So that's is really, uh, so it's, 10 of those is from the team evaluation. Okay. And then you've got a macro exam, strategy exam, and case materials exam, or those? Uh, a macro, yeah, there's an exam that covers macro, some of the case materials. And that's 40. Did that cover the text? Nope, strategy exam from the text is 30. And strategy text, 30. I need to scroll that back. So we're looking and case at materials was 30. And case materials was another 30? Mm-hmm. Case, oh. The macro was 40. That sounds right. Yes. Um, the case materials, and we'll see what that is, is 30. And then the text is 30. Correct. Do I have that correct now? Yep. Good. Thank you. Walked off without that. So you're looking at a 300 point course. And uh, I'm hoping that, particularly since I know all of you and know the quality of work you generally uh, submit that this will be just an interesting exercise. No threat to any grades or anything. If there are any difficulties, I will get with you personally. So, in addition to the assignments, there are readings. Some of the readings are in macroeconomics. I, I throw macro into this course because it's not required as part of the curriculum in this degree. And yet, I believe firmly, and of course I'm biased, having taught it for the last 34 years, that macroeconomics is a big part of understanding what's going on around us and making better decisions in that environment. So we're going to hit the high points in macroeconomics. In fact, we'll start some of that tonight. In addition, there are various readings. There were three of them assigned for tonight. Uh, one called Culture Eats Strategy. One called the BCG Matrix. What was the third one? Point of Just the point of beginning. The point of beginning, if you read that before you picked up JT's hardware, case number one, was kind of, here you are, take it off. 
he's pretty much, and several of you did, pretty much follow that, that outline of what is strategy. Um, that point of beginning is kind of, kind of what I would be putting into a book on strategy, which is geared towards more a little lower level than running General Motors or Apple or something like that. That makes it a hell of a lot more interesting in my mind, too. So where to start? Let's uh, open it up first. Do you got any kind of questions, issues, observations, attitude, expression, complaints? Oh, I listen to complaints regularly. <laughs> confessions? Confessions are always interesting. I have one. Yes, ma'am. I came to class last week, and it was the wrong one. You came oh. to class last week, and it was the wrong one. Well, that, that will be deducted from your overall score. <laughs> We do not meet every other Wednesday. It's a somewhat irregular schedule. Check the dates carefully. I think we only have about five meetings scheduled. And if you find that you would like to get together one or two times more than that, we will probably select a Monday evening or a Tuesday evening, find ourselves a room and sit down, if you want to do that. If, on the other hand, you thought we could meet together effectively over a beer, that too is acceptable in my mind. You know? So. Anytime you want to do that. All right, any other issues? Mechanics of the course, administration, issues with the program? I'm going to ask you at the end of this term, if you will, but it's not required, to give me a, a sort of a synopsis and evaluation of your experience in the organizational management program. The goods and the bads and the uglies. And I, will, I will make you the promise, the vow, that it will remain confidential, but I am interested in how this program is running, where the weak spots are, because I too have identified a few that I'm going to try to attack. In fact, we're having a faculty meeting um, Wednesday the 17th, and I am the featured speaker. Mr. Fitzgerald spoke last time about generating class involvement. I think he's kind of the guy to do that. I'm going to speak in terms of uh, what we're trying to do with this program and the way we're going about doing it somewhat akin to strategy. Do they offer any training in how to maneuver through Canvas to the professors? Or is it kind of like us, we have to learn how to navigate Which it prompts me own? to ask you, why would you ask that Because question? there's just so <laughs> many. I've, I'm graduating this semester as well, and I've been here for two years, and every single professor does things differently. They set the tabs up on the left differently. If they don't put the discussions tab there, you have to find a backdoor way to see if anybody's responded to you. It doesn't always come up on the main page when you log in. And so I had a class over the summer where the professor had given everybody, you know, in some of the cases you can look and see what the grades were, an average and a mean for the whole class, and everybody had C's in participation, including myself. And I was like, you know, I've never gotten a C in participation, and I asked why, and he said, well, not, not everybody responded to at least two posts, and I said, well, you didn't put that in the syllabus, number one. Number two, we can't see whether the discussion posts are there, and I had asked him, put, put the discussion tab on the left-hand side so that we can easily go through that, and it will give you the whole list of discussions, and you can see easily two out of five haven't been read, five out of ten haven't been read. You know, it's, it's pretty easy once you get there. I agree, standardizing. Yeah. The way they set up Canvas would be very helpful. Um, I'm going to jump to the quick aside <laughs> yeah. and let that go by for half a second. Assignment number six, the 100-point case, is for you to build a strategic plan for the organizational management program here at Santa Fe. Oh, that's exciting. Now, when you do that, it will be like many other plans. You have to do it within the existing umbrella that we operate in here at Santa Fe College, which includes some internal constraints and some external constraints. But I will, I will be candid with you in my observations of the way some things go on out here at Santa Fe and, and in, in part how they impact the OM program. One of the things that goes on in this place, and, and now you may hear my military mind coming through, is we have a whole bunch of people running around out here out of step. We have, we have a complete absence of requiring the faculty to learn to do something properly. The best we do is we adopt a new system, Canvas, and we offer training in bits and pieces for those who are interested enough to take the time and go see. 
There is no requirement for standardization. There is no requirement for competence. And so you have a whole lot of reinventing the wheel by the faculty, each of them on their own with their own Canvas page or site or show. I think that's inexcusable in my mind. Here we go. It'd be real clear. The faculty, you will come in and spend one day learning how to set up your shelves according to a reasonably standard format. And if you fail to show, you will either be penalized or just, uh, I don't know, asked to leave. The, the burden of that lack of structure at Santa Fe falls entirely upon you. But it's also frustrating to us because if you don't take the time to go over there and learn stuff, you miss out on many of the things you can do with Canvas. And frankly, I'm guilty of that too. I learned enough to where I thought the course would work comfortably. But I'm sure there are a great many other things I could use on Canvas. But to try to go over there and We're get it We're using the collaborations more. now, and that's great. We used it in the class Chris and I last semester, and that works great because everybody has access to it pretty much anywhere you have now, access to Canvas. Did Jamie get the one set up for this yes, course? Yes, Is that she working? Did. Is everybody else on that collaboration? I know I put all I, the names in. I signed up for it, and this is actually, I'm in the last term, and this is the first time I've used it. Yeah, yeah I saw her make changes to, to the document first, this morning, and she had added another name to uh, somebody. Mike? Mike. Uh, Milton? Yes, that's Milton. Oh, okay, so she added she added you to okay. that this morning. So okay. I think there's seven of us on There's 13 in the class. That, right. And I put down every name I had at the time. I think uh, I've added one more on my own, Mike Chartier. Oh, did he did he enroll? Yeah, he he, he he took it incomplete. He had a lot. Had um, a, his wife had a baby last yes. term. He had a lot going on, so I said, Mike, yeah. just set it down and come back come next back term. Okay. So hopefully we'll see him here in the evening meetings. You know, he's our student body president mm -hmm. as well. But if there are only seven of you so far in that group, I'm going to go back and make sure all the names are in it. And I would encourage all of you to join that yeah, uh, collaboration really well. and see how it works. I did not know about collaboration until two weeks ago. Never heard of it. It's all new to me, so. Yeah. yeah. It's new to me, too. Yeah. And this is I'll be learning last, the Google deal. Some of my last <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Right now, so, yeah. it, it, it's the way a lot of business works these days, you know, using Google Docs. Yeah. Little team projects, etc. Mm -hmm. So, to respond to your question, I don't remember exactly how you said it, but... Uh, they do offer it. It's just voluntary, and uh, they offer training, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's voluntary. Yeah, it's, it's voluntary, and at the same time, whatever training they offer, you're allowed to just take home and develop it as you wish, not according to any standardized no rubric. format. No rubric, yes. Let me illustrate with you, to you one for a moment one other... Uh, example of a problem I've encountered at Santa Fe, and that is that a person who has been a student here applied for a job here and was told at the very last moment, we don't have an official copy of your transcripts. <laughs> this is by the, the Human Resources Department, to which the response was, well, it's over at the registrar. We have to have official transcripts sent there. And the response is, we can't read those transcripts. Go send us another one. Wow. And I, again, where I come from, you call in the HR director, you call in the registrar, and you say, this will be fixed in 30 minutes, or you'll bring me your resignation. That's not the way management is done. And this is why I don't want to be in administration in a college setting, because it is truly like herding cats. There's, there's fear base up there worried about offending the faculty. And there are, it's possible to rise to levels in, in college systems, and I've seen this throughout the country, with a minimum of experience. And so we frequently get people promoted to what we call their Peter, Peter principal level. You know, they're very good at this level, and you promote them up, and you suddenly they're a little over their head. So that's the sort of environment you may have to uh, consider in case number six, developing the strategy for this program. Now, that said, that will be done on a team basis, and I will select the teams. I will notify you as to the team membership. There's another another case here fairly soon. Let me see here. I don't remember when. In the next three or four weeks, and you'll have a team basis for that. I, I anticipate using the same teams throughout the term. Assigned at four. 
assignment for? Wind Song House. Wind Song House, yeah, which is pretty straightforward. Um, I will tell you, too, that I intend to take your case number six stra strategic plan for the OM program and consolidate it into the best of the best and use that as part of my agenda for what I'm trying to see happen to the program. So, uh, if you want to stay in touch with me after you graduate, I'll be glad to appraise you of what's going on, as well as uh, uh, by that time we'll be to the point where I can buy you a beer, because uh, you don't need to grade. <laughs> cool. All right, let's see. Why don't we... Uh, why don't we just chat for a few minutes about that hardware store. Is anyone here familiar with the Ace Hardware Store at Hunter's Crossing in Gainesville? Yeah. It's up on Northwest 43rd Street. It, it, it is literally the store I had in mind when I made up the case. But a, uh, a, a comparative store is down on Newberry Road, down just kind of across the street and down from the Royal Park Plaza where the theaters are, in the little oh, Ace Hardware yeah. Store. And if you walk through either one of those stores, and, and it, does anyone, Milton, you probably remember, do you remember George's Hardware yes. out mm -hmm. there on Newberry Road at 34th? Yeah. It was, that place started up about 1968 when I was a freshman, sophomore, junior in college. And it was, a, George's Hardware I don't think was any bigger than his classroom. And I've never understood how anybody got that much stuff in that little bit of space. And you could go in there, and it was, it was like a whole trip. You could just go in there and spend an hour looking around. Nothing in mind to buy, just, damn, how about that? These, hard, these Ace Hardware stores obviously follow a corporate floor plan. They are laid out much more neatly and not nearly so compressed, et cetera. And I, my impression is they are well stocked, well managed, and the people that I work with, inevitably, almost consistently anyway, are very well trained, very knowledgeable, very helpful. It just occurred to me that as a small business approach to things, that kind of hardware store would offer a lot of things to talk about. So I asked you about your top five questions you would pose if you were going to have your first sit-down meeting <coughs> with the seven employees of the store. And let's see who else was coming to that. Anybody? The accountant. The accountant. The accountant. And what do we know about accountants? <laughs> Accountant here before they speak up. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to make the blanket statement about most accountants. Their world revolves around statements, numbers, concepts, and is not terribly strong into the interrelationship personal side of business operations. Some are very adept at that, most not so much. And I think that's why many people are drawn into accounting is they enjoy working objective, objectively with data and this is the way it's got to be, and this is the right way it's got to be, and they're very comfortable in that environment. And if you recall from the management course, do you recall what kind of personality style that is? D-I-S-C? Oh, uh, <sighs> was it C? C. 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 Highly analytical, detail-driven, meticulous attention to detail. And not all by any stretch, but a number of people who have a high C element in their, in their personality makeup are not necessarily drawn towards social interaction and, and interrelationships, conversations, etc. They don't necessarily read people very well. And so if the accountant is there, perhaps you would want to have him speak first. Because he will have the objective measurements of what he sees in his reports. And he may well, or she, may well have some very insightful advice on, I see from these numbers, here's a problem or here's an opportunity. That's great. But, and this is a bias because I'm not a C, not, not a very high C, that's only scratching the surface of what's going on and what could go on. And that kind of leads me into the idea of that article, Culture Eats Strategy. What was the point of that article? Anybody? How people, how the different personalities interact and, mm -hmm. and, and can affect the morale, if for just one example. Um, mm -hmm. Can in turn affect efficiencies yeah. in um, the big picture. I would say it this way, and I've, I've made this. I started making this point more. I may not may not have been using it when you were in the management course. There's what you do, and that's terribly important. What you do and how you and, and what can you do. 
But how you go about doing that is really going to be the determining factor of whether you're effective. When you're working with people, simply having knowledge is not sufficient. How you impart that knowledge and motivate people and inspire people makes the difference in their productivity. The, you know, by way of their morale, by way, by way of the social capital that you can build within the company. Remember that term? What is social capital? <laughs> Told you we're going to be able to go over yeah. this stuff again, huh? Yeah. What well, is it's, so, your, it, it's the trust factor. It's a trust factor. It's the relationships and the positivity that comes out of those relationships. The, the growing interdependence, trust, and then, in fact, the self-reinforcing morale boosts, ability to ask for help without fear of, of criticism, etc. So, to me, the culture in a business can overcome a poor strategic or a non-existing strategic approach, at least to a great measure. Because that's all about how you go about getting through the day and getting things done. Do you do it with particular attention to detail? Do you look out for your fellow employee? Do you you know, cover for each other, help one another? Do you feel free to go to ask someone else for some help or advice on something you may be a little, little shaky on? And, you know, I, I guess maybe it's in poor form for me in a, the beginning of a strategy to class to tell you that strategy isn't as important as something else. But strategy without the right interaction, the right social capital, the right how, the right culture, isn't worth a damn. And in fact, that's what happens with both strategic plans. <laughs> I sat down or sat down. I stood with, on many an occasion with a group, oh, maybe enough to fill up this room, usually about half this room, senior leaders in a business or a nonprofit or even a governmental agency, and spent two or three days dragging through developing a mission statement, dragging through a values statement. It is a painful, painful process. I will never do it again, God willing. But you finally, after maybe two or three days, you build the mission statement, the value statement, and you set up a system of procedures or, or uh, way, waypoints that you're going to work through and achieve this magic strategic goal. And you get it all written down, and then what happens to it? You put it in a notebook, put it on the shelf, and we go on the way, way we've always done things. Strategic planning isn't worth a damn in that regard. But if strategic planning evolves from the people in that kind of culture where they're all clear on what they're trying to do, then that strategic plan becomes something you can remind one another of or you can talk about once in a while in just a general meeting. So question number one, what would you ask these seven people in this accountant? Clearly we can ask the accountant for some objective measures. But one of the keys to this case was you are now the owner and manager. Why is that different than just being the manager? It's your money. It's your money. It's your time. It's your life. It's your investment. And you're responsible for all the employees' livelihoods too. If you have any moral fiber at all. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Assuming. That, well, let's yes. let's recognize some of that yeah. is non-existent out there too. <laughs> this is true. Well, there's definitely <laughs> and managers that don't. Yes. Take that responsibility. Yes. yes. There are a lot of small business owners whose only ethical thinking is how can I get every dollar possible into my pocket. And they will occasionally make overtures or gestures in some way towards their employees, but they're typically very thin, not long lasting, and not well thought out, and subject to change. Well, I've been just recently have been appointed to a, to a team and I work for county government, the Lodgeville County. And one of our, one of the walls we're running against we're appointed to the team members by the county manager, so now the manager's less. But one of the walls we're running against on Hi. Come on in. developing true career development opportunities and opportunities for if that's your mission. Sure. It's not right. It's our mission, you know, the whole leaders of tomorrow, we don't mm -hmm. call it that, but developing mm -hmm. employees mm -hmm. to be in position to compete mm -hmm. for vacancies as they're coming and we're facing a lot of retirements, not only in top level management, but in mid level. Oh, wow. So it's not specific it's not succession planning as you can't tap someone, but you could certainly help people that, that are interested in having to, to years. develop so that yeah. you don't you know well, this is this is a great it. example that of strategic and, thinking. Right. Yeah. And the wall we're running against is some of the leadership, which means department heads. Mm -hmm. 
how flat out said. Well, if employees want to, you know, learn in advance and build skills, they can do that. It's all fine, but it's not my job to help. It's not my job to help my employees Here build skills. Department level management team mm -hmm. going, well, it's not my job. Okay. Um, you know, and that is just incredibly disheartening yeah. in an organization. Yeah, it is. I agree. Because but where as, does that start? As a lower level manager. You feel about I, I, Right. And I've always took it, why else, why else am I here? If, if part of, the biggest part of what I get satisfaction for in my job, besides the public service part, is enabling those who I have an influence on, you know, in the, you know, their subordinates, giving them an opportunity to advance and to grow. And, and I had somebody who started out as an inspector under me as a city manager. Way surpassed my level. <laughs> but look at your perspective as a manager, and then the, the but, humanitarian view there, if you right. will, in you know putting great value in seeing people advance and improve their lives. Right. Where do we teach that? And as an organization, you know, it's like, well, that is what that's part of what we invest in is people. Well, no, we just here to get the job done. <laughs> My first thought when you were laying that out is that when you have these departmental managers with that cavalier attitude, where does that come from and why does that remain? Right at the top. Yeah. That you're in my job as the top person in any organization is to set the tone of the culture, to lay down the general rules and mores of what we're going to operate on. So which kind of, I'm going to use that to lead back into the first question on this case. What's a, Absent the uh, accountant and his objective measure of things, what's the first thing that perhaps should come to mind? And for me, it's the determination of values. What is of value? What is important in this organization for you individually and us collectively? And as a manager and owner, I should have some say in that. And if I'm going to build, a develop, uh, build or develop an effective organization, I've got to draw everybody in on the same playing field and working in the same direction. And if I can inform your values with my idea of the, of the future and you agree to that, not necessarily overt, yes, that's great, but you buy into it, then we can start talking about where do we want to go. But it's we have to be clear, all of us collectively and individually, why are we here? Why are we here? Why we we have this business, this hardware store. That's our vehicle. That's not our you know live, bri die, breathe it. No. Why are you here? What do you really want out of your life? And how can this be a part of it? One of the things I have my economics classes do is write a choices paper about where are you going to be in five years. And if you can't get that straight in your mind on where you want to be and why you want to be there. How are you ever going to make any progress towards getting there? So, in my view, strategy starts off with buy-in by everybody to a consistent and common set of values. So, and again, I'm just going to, this is an opinion, okay? This is not a black and white right or wrong answer. But in my view, if I had those seven people sitting down, I'd probably, probably invite the accountant to stay as long as he felt comfortable. But I'd want to get to know him before he got to be too privy to this. And I'd be asking the seven people. Maybe, maybe bring me a written document in a day or two and tell me what the most important things to you are about working here and about your life. And where would you like to be in a few years? If we can all buy into where we're going, then we can make a, you know, good progress on how we're going to get there. But if we instead wade into this and say, where's our money coming from? How do we cut down expenses? We've missed the whole point. What is the deeper level motivation of those people who are working with? We have got to tap that and pull it together. Come in. It's a whole lot easier with 70 people than it would be with 700. But if you had an organization of 700 people, what would you be doing? You'd do the same thing in smaller groups. Same thing in smaller groups. You can maybe start with your departmental managers or your vice presidents or whatever. But then you can tell them. You can dictate to them. This is the approach I want you to take with your people. And so maybe before you ever sit down in this meeting, you need to be clear in your own mind what's important to you. If it's important to you to see the development of the people within the organization, then you, then you need to make that very clear to the people who work for you. 
and you may need to reinforce that on their evaluations and in every every instance you can interacting with them. And I think you have to you have to have joint meetings, but you also need to talk to non-supervisory staff without supervision. Management by wandering around. Yeah, Absolutely that's right. right. That's right. Exactly right. I mean, if you if you want to get to the what they're really thinking, mm -hmm. and it may take a now this is smaller, but like in our organization, it takes several meetings. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It takes a long time just for them to trust you. It takes a long time to, for some staff, especially with institutional history or 20-year career, mm -hmm. they've been burned once or twice mm -hmm. offering their opinion. So it's going to take some several times so before what's, what's the first a, a manager is going to actually get them to trust them with an idea. How do we build trust? I mean, that was one of the questions out of the Caproni text. I don't know if you recall it. But trust is an is a interaction between two people. It's a transaction. You are give, both giving and receiving. And how do you make any transaction work? How do you make it endure? How do you make it continue? You have got to give that person more than they think they are giving to you. That's true in a marriage. That's true in a business. That's true in anything. If I buy a lawnmower from you for $100, what is clearly evident? I value the lawnmower more than $100. What's evident on your part? You value the $100 more than the lawnmower. It's very, very simple. But proving that you are giving and giving and not expecting much from them is the first step towards building that trust. There's any number of things you may be able to do. If you can get them to open up and learn a little bit about what's going on in their lives, maybe there are ways you can assist that. If you can take a look at their evaluations or their work history and have a little conversation with them about that, and in some way move some benefit in their direction. If you can prove that you are not there with an agenda to work them to death, you're not there with an ego-driven agenda because this is all about me, and you can begin to foster that trust, and then you can establish those relationships and more importantly that communication that will eventually lead to the, the, the trust you need. So for me, the, the point of the JT's, hard, JT, JT's hardware case was before we can begin strategic planning, <coughs> We've got to all figure out what's important to us and figure out where we want to go. Now, if you had seven people here, uh, suppose you had two of them that said, I like working here. Uh, I'd like to work here for the next 20 years. i got a couple of small kids. I love Gainesville. I want to live here. What's your issue now? How do you figure out a 20-year career progression for this person? In order to keep them. Yeah. And that means not simply how do you promote them in terms of pay, but what else does it take to make them buy into the company and continue these values and these behaviors? That's a whole lot different than the guy that says, well, I'm, you know, I'm, do, I'm killing time between high school and college trying to figure out what I want to do. Yeah. i got to tell you a real personal note on that. I don't buy that crap, okay? Go out and do something. But that person's there for, to get the hourly wage. Do you want to get anything more out of him other than his hours of work? Now, I would address that question to you, Milton. What would you be looking to do or get out of that person? That 19-year-old, uh, just kind of killing time, passing the few years till I decide what I want to do when I grow up? I think you, the trick is to get them engaged to make a difference in the time that they do spend with you. And so it's giving them an opportunity, you know, what you need, obviously you need the best employee you can get to serve your customers and do whatever it is you've hired them to do. Um, but part of that is can you offer them a way to grow and be a more valuable employee later? Yeah. And, okay, you're, you're stocking shelves here at a hardware store, but maybe you could also learn inventory management and be more valuable at at a higher gotcha. wage and at a larger company somewhere else. This person may not be able to visualize it for themselves, but if you're going to have them for three years, what do you think they ought to look like in three years in order to, to have more open doors to a better life? You know, could we help them improve their conversational and customer relationship skills, problem-solving skills? Could we gradually imbue them with growing responsibility to where they built up their own self-confidence? And so if you have an idea on what you could see this person progressing to be over time, I think that informs the way you treat them, the way you, you structure their pay or whatever. For the person that wants to be here for 20 or 30 years, 
how are you going to continually increase their pay? you have any thoughts about that? Because obviously they can't continue at their same 8 or 10 or $12 an hour you're paying them now. Yeah, and unless you're at the very top, you they get to a point where they're at the same level as you, and then what do you do? And there's you nowhere kind of, else to you've, go. You've mm -hmm. invested all of this time in them, and then they probably move to another department where they would be higher than what you're doing, or the same in a different department. So you might structure some sort of uh, retirement plan. Yeah, retirement. Retirement. Or okay. vacation. Think of it this way. Turn it around a little bit. If this business was operating at 100% efficiency, how many people could I do it with and what would my cost be? What revenue could I generate and what is the absolute potential of this business and profitability? And if I have a sense of that, then I understand out of those profits, how much can I afford to show, you know, filter back down to provide career tracks for these people. Okay? And it doesn't take too long of doing that with a very small business like this and you realize there may not be enough profit in this business to support three people through a career. And when you hit that wall, you got to change your sh shift your thinking. What, what would be your next thoughts? This business will never make enough money to support three year three people through their career. Connor? I mean, you could be assuming that, that in its current form, you could grow the business, create more capital in order to give them more opportunities. You know, there's more ways to motivate people rather than just fiscally. Now, obviously, that's the biggest motivator, but there are especially with young people, responsibility is a great motivator. Giving them more responsibility and making them feel important makes them feel invested in your business. I don't want all little sidetracked there, but that's no, the that's fine. Yeah, I, I would suggest to you, money is necessary but not sufficient to motivate. Absolutely, you know? uh, that was kind of the point I was trying to make. Yeah. Hertzberg told us that money is a satisfier, not a motivator. Everybody. It'll keep you from complaining if it's high enough, but if you get it up above that, it's not going to motivate you to work a whole lot harder. Not going to get you frustrated. Yeah, so it's not just money. It's that sense of belonging. It's that sense of positive outlook for my future if I remain with this company. And so, yeah, how do we grow the business? How would you grow a hardware store? How would you grow that into a greater profit potential endeavor? New services, you know, outs, you know, in-home type of services or something like that, you know, something that involves in-home surveys where they could have more, uh, a little more latitude or a little more independence in, in how they sell things. You know, outside sales. Can you give me a specific you know, example? I'm circling around oh towards real. Uh, I don't know, decorating. Okay. You know, branch out into some other areas, you know. Okay. Uh, kitchen fix-ups. Not remodeling, just fix-ups. Like some design, yeah, just small. Yeah. Good. Um, I'll tell you what I think would be a great one. Small engine repair. Yeah. At the back of our hardware store, one of you guys, we're going to send you to school, teach you small engines, and you're going to do small engine repair, and you're going to fix every lawnmower within 13 miles. Hey, that's all keep you in business. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to a bank. Samples in Hot Ace there yes. expanded yep. to lumber. Perfect. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Now, yep. for a long time they had it before the Lowe's went to Lockwood, but still, mm -hmm. okay, it's higher than Gainesville, but you didn't have to drive to Gainesville. Yep. And then the uh, Western Auto does have equipment repair. Okay. I was talking to a banker in Trenton Big. a couple of weeks ago, and I was, I'm helping a friend try to set up a, his own shop as a mechanic. And he said, one of the things we think we can do within the first six months or a year of the business is to open up an adjacent or you know, affiliated small engine repair. And the banker looked at him. He said, you know, we haven't had small engine repair out here for three years. You would stack them up doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you look at your people and you say, what else can you all do? Mm -hmm. What other skills do you have or are you interested in? Maybe we can invest the money to send you to school. And in turn, return for that, you promised me three years as an employee. Beginning to get a sense of what I'm saying. We have got to build all of us into a unit that's all, uh, you know, moving in the same direction with the same values. They feel it's their own business. They, they take ownership of Which it. Which takes me to my next step. What do you think about profit sharing yeah. in a small business like this? Profit sharing as opposed to, oh, hell no, <laughs> or as opposed to bonuses, or just strict profit sharing. Do you have any views on that, experiences on that, anybody? I, I do have experience in profit sharing for a small company that I worked for here in Gainesville. They've since closed, but if, you know, depending on what the revenues were, she would share. And sometimes it'd be, you know, a $2,000 bonus. And each of us felt responsible to do the very best every day. At least I did, and I know that the people that I worked with felt the same way. Um, and, you know, when I needed to go buy furniture and they were one of our clients, I had a $2,000 trade at the furniture store. So it was fantastic. Well, are you familiar with the term open book management? 
open book management. That's where you make your books for the company open and available to all your employees. Here's how we're doing. Every day, come in and check. Or at least maybe every, every month. Here's our financial statements for the month and how we did. A lot of business owners are very uncomfortable with that. Okay? Because if things do go well, they want the lion's share. And even in the normal operation, particularly with a small business like this, this is a cash-based business. There's a lot of cash coming in through the till. And I'm going to guess that 80% of the business owners, and I think it's closer to 99%, pull cash out of that till and don't report it for taxes. And so to go to open book management, you get into a lot of, a lot of problems. But just to expose the term out there, open book management. But the idea of profit sharing, where you do have some control on those financial statements, and you can say every, every month, here's how we did, here's how we did, and every six months, we're going to take a look at how much accumulated profit we got, and you're going to get this much or this much or this much, maybe based on your seniority, maybe based on whatever other things are going on. So there's an alternative. And that, again, fosters buy-in. We're all on this boat together. If it starts to leak and everybody bail like hell, right? Yes. I had a situation like that, you know, where it was the bonuses versus the profit sharing. I worked for a very small company, and we were actually in Alachua, and the company was doing quite well. But we got these amazing bonuses every year at Christmas. They took us on a trip, and everybody got all these fancy bonuses. And for three or four years, it was always, well, we're going to set up a profit sharing plan. We're going to set up a profit sharing never plan. Never did. And it never <clears throat> happened. And I was on the accounting side of it, so I saw all the bills that were going out. So I had some idea of the money that was coming in. And it got to the point where he felt like they didn't, I felt like they didn't value me because it was like we keep dangling this thing thinking, okay, we're going to do it. But in the meantime, we're going to give you this little bit over here. And you know the two don't compare when you get down it's to it. stale donut. Yeah. Which means you better start <laughs> off understanding who you are and what your values are and don't make promises you know you're not really going to keep. But if, in fact, your character is the sort that does genuinely care about your people and wants to see them progress mm -hmm. and can stand the pain of not having every dollar of profit come out of that business into your pocket, then that open communication, it'll be hard to beat. Yeah. The other thing that happens with something like that is it becomes self-policing. Somebody yeah. starts slacking off, the other six of them are going to say, let me talk yeah. to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're affecting my bottom line now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Exactly. That's peer intervention. That's great. Yeah. Yes. Thank you from having to do it as the manager. That's an ideal situation. Yeah. As, as long as it doesn't fester yeah. into yes. you know, yeah. tribal warfare. <laughs> <laughs> Second. I said that's a manager's job. Well, your job as the owner to make sure that that doesn't happen. Exactly. You enact profit sharing in order to get to motivate individuals, and you start to see that little tussle. That's when you pull everybody in the room and have the whatever you want to call it meeting. I didn't have a profit. And it may well be in this setting when you're just coming into a business that's, what, three years old or five years old and you really don't know how it's going, you don't even talk about profit sharing for the first two, three, five years. You got your feet on the ground to see how it's going. But is it in the back of your mind? 